Good morning and welcome, everybody. We are learning the Mitzvah Hashem, the holy book written by Rabbi Yonashen Steif in the 1930s, providing us insight into God Almighty's divine guidance for every single human being. And his intention, as we've learned before, was that every single human being should know what's written in here. And uh, finally, we are getting to the point of bringing it to the English-speaking world and to the German-speaking world, and God willing, to every other language uh, shortly after that. And I wanted to draw attention to the urgency of the learning that we're doing over here. We see the activities uh, among the people in the world who've lost their insight into their connection to God Almighty to try to desecrate and disturb and confuse the human beings in this world, to get them confused and fearful, to get them to forget that they're connected to God Almighty, that they're created in God Almighty's divine image. And the source of this message is in the Torah. The message of hope, the message of guidance for every single human being is in the Torah. And this is, as we've learned before, preceded even the written Torah on Mount Sinai that was given on Mount Sinai that Moses, our teacher, wrote down later on uh, at God Almighty's command. But before that, this, these teachings of the fact that every human being is created with inherent goodness by God Almighty in his divine image with a purpose in this world, and this world has a purpose, and the primary purpose of human beings is to recognize God Almighty and bring him into the world more human beings who will recognize God Almighty and know that they're created in God Almighty's divine image. So the Torah is the, the both the oral Torah and the written Torah are the source, the transmission method by which humanity has transmitted from generation to generation this awareness of who we really are, who our creator is, and what our role is in this great creation. And as a result of knowing that we're created in God Almighty's divine image, then we will treat ourselves differently and we will treat our fellow human being differently, seeing that they, just as we are, are created in God Almighty's divine image. And the disturbing news reaches us that not only is there has been the removal of the teaching of the knowledge of God Almighty from practically every single school system in the world over the last 100 years, 150 years, leading to terrible consequences. But even the residual decency that may last and the, the, the residual appearance of propriety in the world is, is disintegrating. We see that now Sweden has approved the burning of a public burning of a Torah scroll, which is one of the great tragedies that is associated with the times that we're in right now, that a Roman official uh, in the times of the Roman conquest of the Holy Land publicly burned a Torah scroll as an act of defiance against God Almighty, but also as an act of war against humanity. Because the, the, the attack on the Torah, which is already going on, it, it's, the burning of a public burning of Torah scroll brings to our attention how degraded the state of affairs is. It says in the, in the, um, in the Talmud, in Mesechtas Hulin, Tractate Hulin, on the 92nd page, on the, third, on the first side, says that there's not only seven commandments that apply to all human beings, but there's 30 commandments. And we've learned the Ramah Mifano describing what those 30 commandments are. And the... Gomorrah goes on to say that the non-Jews are, are not, not fulfilling their end of the bargain and keeping these 30 commandments, but at least there's three things that they do not do as, as an, an indication of their, and in spite of the fact that, that they've lost sight of the message of the Torah, but there's at least three things that they don't do. And those three things are that they do not write marriage contracts between two men. They do not sell human meat in the marketplace. And the third is that they respect the Torah. And we see that we've come to a situation in our own generation where these three things are already disappearing quickly from the world. We see that 
the uh, acts of writing marriage contracts between men is already being pushed and accepted and, um, in many, many countries in the world and considered to be something that's acceptable. Uh, and then there's now they're talking about culturing human meat, selling it and making it into a, uh, I mean, when you, they write these articles, that's, these are trial balloons to condition our minds into accepting this as, as normal and acceptable. And the third is the respect for the Torah, where now there, there, there is a open war against the Torah. And to the extent of considering it acceptable to burn it. And if you look at the comments that people make in support of this burning, like somehow it's just, it's just acceptable. You know, it's a, the fact that it's a book is holy to you doesn't mean that it can't be burnt. In fact, it's the right of every human being to burn whatever they want. So that's what they write. So the point is, we have to realize over here the urgency of the hour. If people have come to the place of such a low level that they are willing to publicly burn a, a Torah scroll, and that's considered accept, acceptable and ratified by a government. It, it's fulfilling the prophecy that it says that the... Um, one of the signs of the coming of the messianic redemption is that the governments of the world will uh, turn over, become the turn over the half of the minus. They will turn over to the denial of God Almighty. And the question is, why is that connected to the coming of Mashiach? It, should, it seems to be the opposite of the redemption. The redemption is that every human being is going to realize they're created in God Almighty's divine image. Every human being is going to recognize that. There's nothing besides God Almighty. And so how is the government denying that there's God going to have any connection with the positive outcome that we are anticipating? So Rabbi Steif answers at the beginning of this holy book that we're learning, that the answer is that when the, the governments will become militant atheists, Marxists, so that's the militant branch of atheism, when they become militant atheists, they will be bringing about the, the, the dismantling of civilization. And they will, as a result, be rampant violence, riots in the streets, inflation. Everything that we have seen play out over the last 150 years in the Marxist march towards world revolution. And the because once people are, are untethered from their understanding and knowledge of God Almighty, then really, like they say, all chaos breaks loose. There's just chaos, and it's the chaos is not merely um, that the Marxists are organizing and prompting it, but they're actually people are so untethered that they'll join in the bandwagon, as we see in the United States, that people will use um, a an excuse to just go and loot stores. Um, just steal things with no connection whatsoever to whatever they, they, the official excuse for the protest is. So this shows us that lurking in the right on, on the cusp of public expression is this chaos, is this, is this um, wild activities of people just to get whatever they want, to get whatever they can right now. And that's what the goal of the taking God out of, the, out of the system is that people will then act that way, which brings a destabilization of the system, which brings a collapse of the system, with the system being the civilization, that there's economic, um, economic respect uh, business, which is people are selling their goods and services, which is a reflection of people's private property, and each person bringing his unique divine gift to the world. The whole concept of having... Um, your own private property is that you are able to take be uh, sh a shepherd to be a to take dominion over the resources that God Almighty has blessed you with, and then to use that as, bene as benefit or a for benefit of other people, and then there's a mutual exchange of of benefit. So all that becomes disrupted. In fact, Marx is one of the. If you read Marx's uh, works, he talks about that everyone should be able to do the same job and that people, there should be no individualization in uh, craftsmanships and workmanship and so forth. Everyone should be interchangeable because they want to eliminate 
the concept of the, the they want to eliminate the expression of the divinity in each person that each one has a separate skill and that skill is expressed by what draws them what inspires them what the circumstances of their upbringing are that they're exposed to different possibilities and different trades and so forth and then they um, are drawn to that and they're able to continue that service to mankind so if they grew up in a family that does a certain trade or in a community that has a certain industry they'll be able to contribute that to humanity so all that is the attempt is to destroy that expression and to create this um this this it's not about creating a um a, a better result it's about destroying the and and denying the divine so this is god forbid so this is brought to the forefront by this shocking attempt to burn in the public square a safer torah when the torah both the oral torah and the written torah is the foundation of civilization meaning to say surreptitiously to take god out of the school system and to say they're not going to talk about God because maybe some atheist is going to be offended is open warfare on God and open warfare warfare on the people who are being denied the opportunity to learn about God Almighty. But they're not, they're claiming when they say that, that it's still permissible for each person to believe what they want. And they, they claim that they respect the individual beliefs of each person, just they won't be doing in a group setting where one person might be expressing belief in God and another person doesn't believe in God. And the claim is that's going to cause some sort of um, trauma to the person who doesn't believe in God. So, but they claim that the person who believes in God, he's still respected and he's allowed to do what he wants to do. But we see that that comes to the next level because the next level is really revealing what's the intention in the plan to make war against God Almighty and make war against humanity. And that is to take the very transmission of God Almighty's divine guidance for every human being to uplift every human being and to publicly destroy it as an indication that this is the revolution intends to remove this from the world. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that the excuse used for this act is actually just a deception because the the uh, whatever whoever the identical person who's doing this or plans to do this god forbid claims to be and whatever his grievances are and and against um people uh, the jewish people or get what's going on in the holy land and so forth um is is all an excuse to push the marxist revolution because we know as we've learned before that the marxist as as an expression of a mullik they disguise themselves by using the language of revolution in different countries and different areas that it sounds like they're native to that topic or native to that issue or native to that grievance but really it's just marxism a mullik is using it's disguising itself with that um with that language in order to try to confuse us so it has nothing to do with what the issue that they're claiming that the reason that justifies their outrage to therefore want to burn the Sefer Torah. It is part of a revolutionary progression of the world using many different excuses to justify it at the moment in time, what the next level of revolution is. Now, we have to understand that this is a declaration against humanity. People are calling out that this is anti-Semitism. Well, this is not about anti-Semitism. This is about a war against God Almighty. We have to be very clear because the, the response to say it's anti-Semitism is just part of the phony dialectic that this somehow has to do with hatred of the Jews. It has nothing to do with hatred of the Jews other than the, that the Jews are the ones bringing and carrying forth from generation to generation without any modification, without any adulteration, without any watering down carrying forward God Almighty's divine message to every single human being. So it's not really, what's the antagonism here is antagonism against the source of the divine wisdom and an antagonism against the representatives of the divine wisdom, which includes not only the Jewish people who are carrying God Almighty's divine wisdom in the world and for the, on behalf of every human being, 
but a war against every human being because every human being is created in God Almighty's divine image. So burning the Sefer Torah represents the opposite of what we're accomplishing over here. What we're accomplishing by learning Torah over here together is to say and to remind each one of us and to teach the loving teachings of the Torah that are brought down from generation to generation by the Torah sages to remind every human being who they are. To burn the Sefer Torah, to burn the Torah scroll, is to work to cause every human being to forget that they are created in God Almighty's divine image. So Rabbi Shtaif says that in this chaos, this developing chaos, and the open, as the warfare against humanity becomes more and more open, what's actually going to happen is that human beings will recognize that everything that they've been taught in the Enlightenment system and the Marxist system has brought about destruction and chaos. And they will say, who has the answers? And they're going to turn to the Jew, who until now they've just been ignoring, and say, these people have been carrying the Torah for thousands and thousands of years. The Torah, giving of the Torah was over 3,333 years ago. And that's the written Torah. We've, and, and we're continuing the carrying of the Torah that was given earlier to Adam and so forth, orally. So for 5,783 years, they're going to say, you, the Jewish people are carrying the answer. And they'll go to the Jewish people and say, teach us the answer. That's what Rabbi Steif says is what the connection is between the nations, the governments turning over to becoming militant atheists, militant warriors against God, is because why does that, that how does that connection to the redemption? Because the more bold and the more grotesque their militant atheism and war against God and against humanity becomes, the more it will shake people up to realize that they've been lied to all this time and all these concepts that they've been taught about you know, uh, in um, the, the, these enlightenment terms that sounds resonate with the human ear because they are co-opting true concepts of liberty and uh, divinity and turning them into man-made terms of the enlightenment, which then leads to the dark. Enlightenment is the real, the darkening of humanity, darkening of the intellect of humanity by cutting off the connection to the real source of light the real source of insight which is the divine wisdom by cutting that off then you that's how they accomplish this this destruction of the individual human being and the destruction of civilization so our job is god forbid so our job is we cannot say oh well that's what they're doing and um it doesn't really affect me because i got i got things figured out i'm on the right path the fact of the matter is first of all the burning of a Torah scroll is, an, is, a, is, is a tragedy that requires mourning for uh, all humanity to mourn such a tragedy because it's a war against God and it's a war against all humanity. Number two is what's the proper response? The proper response is to learn more Torah. It's to bring more Torah into the world. For every Torah scroll that's destroyed, God forbid, there should be a thousand new Torah scrolls written. We should start a campaign to write a, a thousand new Torah scrolls and bring them to every corner of the world. And we should be calling on every human being to look inside what the Torah has to say. Because if someone's, the, the more outrageous they become, it's an opportunity for people to realize what's being robbed from them. It's an act of robbery from humanity to do such a thing. And, and also, if we go back to the um, commandments that the, the Ramama Fano, we said there were 30 commandments. So um, they include not only the, we know that the first one is idolatry as, the, as it's listed, he listed over here, but it says over here, that one of the commandments that applies in the, the not to blaspheme God is the obligation, a positive commandment to honor the Torah and to, to labor, to, to work and learn the Torah that applies to the children of Noah, the non-Jewish people. Um, and because a person who learns Torah 
is like the high priest in the holy temple. So an incredible thing over here. You have a gift. Every human being has a gift. That when you learn Torah, the Torah that applies to every human being, you're like the high priest in the holy temple. So someone's coming along and they want to burn that so you can't learn it to, to publicly attack that. Who are they attacking? They're attacking your ability to reach this incredible level of being like the high priest in the holy temple. So that's what we have to, to understand is that this is a, po there's a positive commandment to learn Torah and a positive commandment to respect the Torah. And obviously doing anything against that is a negative commandment, is, is a violation of God Almighty's divine wisdom because who, who's really interested in the well-being of humanity would attack or destroy something that's we're coming to uplift humanity. Only a person that is caught in the tentacles of a malik and the a malik's revolution and war against God Almighty would possibly advance such a thing. So we have to recognize this. We have to now increase in our Torah learning and realize that the problem in the world is not even really this Marxist. It's the real problem is that people are, are not aware of God Almighty. They're not learning enough Torah. And therefore, our job is to bring this to the next level. And so I want to encourage everyone to take this to heart. And when you see these distressing things, to realize that it's an opportunity for you individually to increase in Torah learning, for me also, and also increase in bringing the knowledge of God Almighty to every single human being, because that is the real underlying problem, and that's the only solution. I'd like to briefly share with you some of the incredible work that's going on behind the scenes over here in the taking the learning that we've been doing and bringing it now to more human beings. And I'm going to share the screen over here. We've long wanted, we said at the beginning when we, we now I think 68, 69, uh, but learning uh, lessons that we've learned together here. And we, when we started, we said our goal was that the, we would take the learning that we're doing here together and turning it into uh, a transcript, which would then become the basis of a uh, book in English that would, take since I'm speaking in English, that would then become uh, both a translation of the Rabbi Stipe's work and a commentary on it. And then we spoke about it, then translating that into German. So this is actually starting to happen with the great contributions of, um, first of all, thank you to God, thanks to God Almighty, who's um, brought us to this day to be able to get this far. And um, I just want to share with you on the screen over here so you can see the progress and see what each one of your contributions is making in attending, in, um, in asking questions, and summarizing it, um, and here, and translating it and transcribing it. So here is, you can see on the screen, this is the, first, this is the title page of the book we're learning, the holy book we're learning. I'll make it a little bit bigger here. Um, and then we have here the beginning. This is the translation, uh, sorry, the transcription of the first learning that we did together, which you can find on YouTube. It's number one. And we went through and we edited it. And um, first it was transcribed and then it was edited. And then if you go through this, so okay, it's spinning over here. So it goes to the the um, the, tran the transcription and the edited transcription. And then here's a copy of the letter from the Lubavitch Rebbe that we referenced in the very first learning that if the non-Jews of the world had been observant to the seven laws of Noah, then there would not have been a uh, Holocaust by any way of possibility. Not, and so this is something that we uh, quote, bring this actual letter here and then continues the, the, um, trans the introduction, the transcription. And then we have over here, one of our dear students over here had uh, participants in this learning translated it into German. So now we have the actual realization, the beginning of this actually coming into two languages 
And um, here we go. This, this is incredibly inspiring. Now that is just the introduction. Now I want to show you over here the what we took it further. And now this is a line by line translation um, from the further on in that first lesson. And we could see over here how it's broken up. So we have the original text up here in the in Holy Tongue. Then we have the translation, the um, translation based on my translating it during the learning. And then under the line, we have the commentary. So when I explained each one of the commandments and so forth, um, and insights that we shared are, are here also available for every person to read. So I we did it this way with the intention that a person who was fluent in the Holy Tongue could read it up here person who at the, that moment in time wants to focus just on the translation and and also maybe as a way for them to better understand the actual um original then we have the translation separated from the commentary and then the commentary in the bottom a person could read all or as much as they want of this commentary and so this here um is goes on then we have another section from the original more translation and um, then we have commentary. And so this goes on here for a number of pages. You're um, happy to um, uh, share this with you if you'd like to start to learn this. And uh, the, as we say, the main, the main goal over here is the learning. That's the learning. But what's the main goal of learning? It's to take action. So when we... Are when we learn this and we understand how God Almighty is guiding us and speaking to us, then we can take action. So I want to also make a an, an appeal for each one of you to understand that the tremendous cost that there is in this, um, and to think about ways that we can bring in the resources, the financial resources, to be able to dedicate the time that's required to be able to accomplish this just for the one page so so far that i showed you in the in the um example over there that's just one page of rabbi steif's work it took over three hours this is in addition to the transcription um which the transcriber does need to get paid and then there's the editing and then the further editing and then the layout and um so just a few lines rabbi steif takes at least three hours to to go through and put together and um in addition then there's the translation part of it and then there's going to be all the part work on further editing and then you know putting it together in a final form so this is going to be something that's going to it's a, it's a major undertaking and it's a gift from god almighty for us to have the merit to be on the forefront of this undertaking and so many of you are already generously supporting this and i just want to encourage you according to your ability, if you're able to, to continue to support, to increase your support, and you could particularly designate it for this work. And also think about who do you know that would be inspired to see this happening and coming to fruition and would be able to sponsor this and support this in, in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to bring a work of this magnitude to the forefront of the awareness of, of mankind. So this is really, really very exciting. I want to thank you in advance. First of all, thank you already for everything you're doing by being here and propelling this forward. This is this is an incredible opportunity and so uh, energizing to be able to do this and also to think about how, and thank you in advance for your ideas, your, your support and, and both the contributions people who are here learning with us are making in terms of, of transcribing and, and translating and bringing this to the next level that it's going to be done in a professional manner and um, we'll have the ability to, to devote our time with menuchas and nefesh, with calmness of the soul, to be able to bring this fulfillment in a, in a speedy way. At the rate that it's going right now, um, we're, we're up to you know, one page of Abba Steif. It's, we've been learning for this for uh, quite a while now. And we need to really bring this to the forefront of the world's awareness much, much faster. So I encourage you and look forward to your participation in that in every way that you can.
um, both your time, your contribution, your being here and reading it and correcting it and also learning it and sharing with others, inviting more people to learn with us and, and also um, helping with the financial part is greatly, greatly appreciated. God Almighty will certainly bless you for being here in this cornerstone of remoralizing the entire world. Here we have a question before we uh, bring up Rabbi Steif's, uh, what we're going to learn today. I have a question over here about the duties of the heart. And um, this is Chavis Olavavis. I can post over here um, the link. Um, just one second here. A link if you know people that are able to and uh, inspired to help support this and, and build this, just uh, and attach the link for that. Okay, we have an offer here uh, for a Japanese translation. Amazing. Okay, we have many Japanese-speaking people in the world, and, and we're going to look forward to uh, them all knowing this. So just want to address the question was posed a little earlier, and the question is like this. Short question regarding the duties of the heart. Regarding non-Jews, is it allowed for everyone to read and study or only for Noahides who accepted the seven commandments and live by that? From where do we learn that it is okay, not okay? Maybe the Rebbe wrote it in one of his letters or on the video, on a video. Many thanks. So this is uh, addressing a really important point just for way of background. The duties of the heart is a cornerstone of recognizing that it's not just about our actions that we take. The Torah does speak a lot about the actions. We've said before it's the actions, but the cornerstone of our understanding of what God Almighty wants from us is to know that it is essential that our inner state of mind and our inner state of being be in a tranquil place called tranquility of the soul, Menucha Sanefesh. And while the Torah's commandments <clears throat> command us to act properly, even when we're not feeling tranquil inside, even when we're not in a good mood, even when we don't want to be loving, we have a commandment to be loving. Are we one of the um, gifts of the divine commandments is that it uplifts us to conduct ourselves in line with God Almighty's vision for us, what we're capable of, even when we are not in that frame of mind. But it's not enough to merely to do the right thing, although we have to do the right thing whether we're in that frame of mind, but it's not enough. Really, the, our state of mind is a, the focus. Torah is telling us that is where we should be. In fact, the six constant commandments relate to our state of mind. For example, knowing that there's a God Almighty and that there's nothing besides God Almighty is a, one, two of the constant commandments that apply for every human being to know that there's nothing besides God Almighty. Now that commandment to know that there's nothing besides God Almighty, the, the um, knowledge of God Almighty, that there is a God Almighty and that there's nothing besides him is not an intellectual experience. Uh, okay, fine. Now you, I got the idea there's one, there's not two, there's not three, there's not 50, there's only one. That is, okay, there's an intellectual aspect to that. But the real core is that you will come to a feeling of knowing that you are completely being taken care of, that you have been taken care of, you are being taken care of, and you will always be taken care of, of God Almighty, who is creating you lovingly at every instant from nothing. So the key is your state of serenity your state of tranquility in everything that you're doing, in every interaction, when things are going well, and when things are not going well, when things are going the way you want and that everything's timed exactly right and everyone says the right thing, and when it's total chaos and you don't see anything going the way you want it to go. In fact, mm -hmm. these 68 lessons that we've learned together um, besides the introduction and so forth and Rabbi Steif's general overview that we learned together, but we've been learning the commandments that relate to the prohibitions on idolatry. 
why is it so important, all these details in the prohibition of idolatry? And we're going to learn today some further details of that inside Rabbi Steif's holy work. Because every one of those idolatrous thoughts that you acknowledge or believe in a separate power other than God Almighty strikes right at the core of your state of well-being, of your tranquility. Your soul is not restful if you believe that there is a God Almighty, but there's also some other force out there. How could you possibly be tranquil? It's 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 contradiction in terms. The Chayvus of is the 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 holy book that the duties of the heart that the question is referring to is coming to ground us in this certainty that there is nothing besides God Almighty, and that therefore we are able to rest assured in every fiber of our being, in our feeling, in our sense of well-being, that we are completely being taken care of. Here, the past, the present, the future, this world, the next world, there's nothing that's possibly going to concern us. We have spoken already that there are things that we know we have to take action about. We see improper things in the world. We see people suffering. We, we need to take um, action and definitive action and rapid action. But we're not personally in turmoil. We see that this, we see that this requires action and with a sense of, of wanting to do the right thing because God Almighty is calling us to do the right thing. We're going to do it, but we're doing it from a place of calmness, from a place of settledness and groundness. And in fact, as we described, we could see how the chaos that we're seeing in the world is a, a reflection of the chaos in us. And second of all, we see how it fits into God Almighty's plan and how we can play a part in bringing about the intended result. So it's absolutely essential that every human being learns the duties of the heart. And every human being, wherever he is, in whatever state of mind he is right now, because from the duties of the heart's writings, a person will come to greater clarity. For example, he has a discussion of the fact that there's nothing besides God Almighty. He has a discussion of the, the tranquility of the heart, the shar bitochon, the gate of certainty that God Almighty is taking care of us. So every human being will benefit from learning this. And we know that Rabbi Shtai said earlier that the learning of Torah that applies to the non-Jews applies to all writings, all Torah writings that are going to improve the character and the life of a human being. And for sure, learning the duties of the heart is going to improve a person's character. Because when you know that there's nothing besides God Almighty and he's taking care of you, you can't get angry at your spouse. You can't get angry at your kids. You can't get angry at your neighbors because you know that there's nothing besides God Almighty. You know that anger is an act of idolatry. So the duties of the heart is really getting to the core of the matter, which is that our grounding in the fact that there's nothing besides God Almighty is going to express itself in our lives in a life of joy and a life of calmness and a life of love, a life of connection with other people. And this is what every human being needs. Now, if you're going to say, well, this guy who's reading, your, this, this person, non-Jewish person is going to read it. He's in the middle of, you know, he just got up from worshiping God to forbid some idol, and he's going to go back to worshiping some idol afterwards. So there's two things about that. Number one is the duties of the heart is teaching him Torah that is, flies to him as a human being created in God Almighty's divine image. And number two is learning it will encourage him to see the falsity of his idolatry and come to recognize that there's nothing besides God Almighty. And number three is we, as we always emphasize over here, we can never say, oh, those people, they're the idolaters and I've got everything figured out. We also, each one of us inside of us have our acts of idolatry and our thinking of idolatry where we are afraid of something, where we are looking for validation from other people, where we are ascribing power 
and treating other things in the universe and the creation as having power, those are acts of idolatry. They can be very subtle. But if we were to hold ourselves to a standard until you've completely rid yourself of idolatry, you can't you know, read this holy book of the duties of the heart. We ourselves are each one of us entertaining idolatrous thoughts, fearful thoughts, anxious thoughts. These are all thoughts to thinking that God Almighty can't take care of us. If God forbid, if we think that thought, if we entertain it and, and take it seriously and let it ruminate on it, then we are going into idolatrous thoughts. If we regret the past and say, if only I'd done that, instead of doing this, I would be here. That, that's idolatry also. Because you're denying, or if I do it, I'm denying the fact that God Almighty wants it to be exactly the way it is right now. This is, this is as it is, is the way it's meant to be at this moment in time. Not an excuse not to do something to change my behavior for the future, to change my input into the world for the future. So the world should be a better, better representation of the divine, better host of the divine. But regretting the past is also idolatry. So if we're honest about it, how much idolatry are we, each one of us, entertaining on a daily basis? So... So we have to understand that while this guy is still maybe physically bowing down to an idol, but we're not, and, and we know that that idol's false, but we should not hold ourselves to be haughty that we, we're, 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 you know, super, uh, somehow super beyond any connection to idolatry. We are at, still entertaining and, and struggling with thoughts of fear and anger and anger is, is called idolatry. E being egotistical is called idolatry. Not giving charity is called idolatry. This is what Rabbi Steif talks about at the beginning. The different things that are, are considered part of the prohibition of idolatry and how those apply to the, every single human being. So I definitely, the answer to your question is definitely should learn duties of the heart. And um, Tanya also, yes, you want to ask a question about Tanya. Um, the, the concepts of not, not only the gate of unity, as you say, but also the entire Tanya um, is something that is learnable by every single human being um, because it's really Tanya is a manual on thought. Tanya is coming to teach us that our feelings will go and then our follow our feelings and then our actions will will go in the direction in whatever direction our thinking is going so it's a manual for thought for every single human being to recognize that what you think about is the you're going to have emotions about that and then you're going to act in that regard. So actually, if you if you pay close attention to the Tanya, you'll see that the Alta Rebbe will talk about the oneness of God, but he's bringing that as, and obviously that's the only reality, but he's giving that as an example in his manual on thought as to how you should realize that if you put your thinking into the oneness of God, you will develop love for God Almighty, and you will develop love for all his creations, and you will act accordingly. The opposite is also obviously understood from what he's writing. If a person puts himself into thinking about chocolate cake, then he's going to develop a love for chocolate cake, and he will exert all his energy and devote his attention to fulfilling his desire for chocolate cake. And if he goes, that's if thinking about matters of the physical world. And if he starts to think negative thoughts about God and negative thoughts about humanity, God forbid, then he's going to end off his whole emotions will become worked up. And then his actions will take actions against God and against humanity. So our thought is our rudder in life. And he's explaining to us 
how to correctly use it to, to guide our entire existence towards what will be good for us and for other people around us. And then he addresses things like joy and the, import, the essentialness of joy, because if you know that you're created in God Almighty's divine image, you're going to be joyful and not to be bothered by the fact that all kinds of stray thoughts come into our heads because those stray thoughts are coming from God Almighty. And our job is to exercise our free choice in every instant to decide, do I want to take this thought seriously or not? That's a lifetime of service of God Almighty. And if you did take it the, an improper thought seriously, momentarily, or ruminate on something, you could let go of it at any moment. That's what the altar is telling us. So it's, it's in a critical explanation for us to see who we really are. And uh, so, yes. And, and I actually just yesterday in the Yeshiva Shem Abra, when we learned Shabbos afternoon, there's no recording of it because it was on Shabbos, but we were learning um, one of the people comes to the learning, he brought up that he has health concerns. And we actually, instead of learning the gate of oneness, we shifted our attention to learning the 31st letter from the Geras to Kedish, from the holy letters that are printed in the fourth section of Tanya, uh, because he addresses the, the clear definition of what health is, what illness is, and how to bring about health. In, and an individual person and in the relationship between human beings as a whole and in bringing the divine presence into the world, it's all the same, exact same, um, under this exact same reality that we need to be understanding. So yes, learn and ask questions, please. Okay, so we answer that question. Let's, let's spend some time now, um, in the remaining time that we have, let's, let's make some more progress with what Rabbi Steif is teaching us, and nothing we've said here has been a distraction from what from Rabbi Steif is teaching us, because he's teaching us this in order. He's taking his entire Torah knowledge and, and pouring it into this holy book so that we should have the ability to see the world correctly. And you should be able to see where the source of the divine wisdom is. Now, the source of the divine wisdom is in each one of us. God Almighty is speaking to each one of us constantly, but we benefit from seeing and being uplifted by the wisdom that others have written down. Like Rabbi Steif said, that a, any human being is required, he's obligated in the, in the laws that apply to every human being, even if he never learned a word of Torah, because he would, he would come to understand it, he would come to see it just from observing the world. But how much better is life and how much more we could accelerate the goodness in life and increase the goodness in life when we, instead of trying to figure it all out ourselves, we can benefit from those who had the insights in the past and had the love for us to put the time, put pen to paper, be able to bring it to our attention, their insights. And with these insights, we can go even further than what they saw because we have the benefit of our own unique, each one of us has the benefit of our own unique divine insight. So I'm gonna pull up over here so we're continuing the learning. Shin Mem Hey over here. We're continuing the learning. And we're up to a commandment over here. If you recall last time we learned about not swearing in the name of idolatry and not causing others to swear in the name of idolatry. So we learned over here, we're going to pull up now the Torah verse. This here should, uh, hopefully it's in front of you, is, um, can you see the Torah? Uh, English or tr translation here into English. And we're looking here in the 23rd chapter of the book of Exodus in chapter in verse 13. It says, Everything that I've said to you, you shall guard, be aware of. Guarding is also the same word as guarding. The shame, um, Elohim Acherim. And the names of other gods you shall not mention or remember. Taskiru is, it can be um, remembering to mention. And it should not be heard. Shema is the same word as in the in saying Shema Yisrael. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's hearing. So lo yishama alpicha, it should be not be heard through your mouth. Not only should you not mention it, but what we learned last time is you cannot cause another human being to take an oath or make a mention of a false god. So we're going to see over here the continuation of this concept. And we should you should have now here up Rabbi Steif. So we're up to chapter 24. Ashara Lamedia. This is a warning to a mediach as a person is like a, a, a missionary, a person who's missionizing, proselytizing on behalf of idolatry. And this is, uh, you could look in the Chinuch, the Sefer Chinuch, the 87th commandment, where he organizes the commandments according to how they, the order they appear in the Torah. And he says like this, Aleph, lav picha, included, within the commandment that it should not be heard through you, through your mouth. You should not cause others to mention idolatry. You shouldn't mention it yourself, obviously. Included in this general prohibition is also who as har le mediach is the prohibition to a proselytizer, a, a, a missionary, missionary of idolatry. See, he has in parentheses over here, you could see the Talmud and the tractate Sanhedrin on the 63rd page on the second side. That means to say that you should not call to human beings, B'nai Adam, the sons of men, the man uh, of Adam, the sons of Adam, to serve idolatry or to lazarism. So one is not to call them, saying here is here, saying to them, here is something that you should serve, and and not also lazarism al kah. Lazarism means to um, accelerate or to encourage them to do this. So let's say they're already worshiping that idolatry. You cannot go and tell them do more, become more. Uh, active participants in that idolatry. The filo lo So even if this person who's doing this calling, this missionary himself, is not serving the idolatry. Vilo mina paulas, and he's not doing one of the actions from the forbidden actions that we discussed. For example, bowing down. We discussed that there's. Uh, activities that are forbidden to do to any idol, and then there's activities that are unique to a particular service of a particular idol that are also forbidden. This person here, this missionary, is not, may not be serving this idol. He may not be doing any of these activities. Rak Hakrilavat, all he's doing is missionizing. All he's doing is calling out the people to serve or to recognize or to believe in this idolatry or to serve it. This is called a mediach. Uh, okay, so the, um, the, the, here's the, the key thing that we want to see over here, or many key things, but one is that we've learned before, obviously, the belief in idolatry is forbidden. The service of idolatry is forbidden. We've gone through many different aspects of that. But here we're bringing a new level of understanding, which is that a person who calls others or encourages them to be involved in idolatry, or encourages them to increase their idolatry, is also engaged in a forbidden act, even if he himself is not serving that idol. So this is when a person is um, calling to two or more. This concept of the Mediach is, is uh, referring to two or a person who calls to two or more. He's he's making like a public or or in the presence of two people or more to call them to serve the idolatry or to cause, encourage them to increase in their idolatry. A person who is not... Um, trying to processize or, or missionize 
more than one person. He's only speaking to one person. He's not called a mediach. He's called a mesis. It's, an, it's a person who's doing it on an individual basis. He's going from person to person, and he's trying to recruit that person into the idolatry. He's trying to convince them of the idolatry. That's called a mesis. And you can see the Rambam, Maimonides, in the fifth chapter of the laws of idolatry. The Tzarech Iyon, now we're in the square parentheses, the Tzarech Iyon, gam b'nei noach, muzar shelo lo asis, v'shelo la diach. Yochi lo rabim, lo vei We all, now we have to ask ourselves, we have to uh, investigate. If also non-Jews, the children of Noach, are warned not to missionize, whether the Hossis, meaning to say to uh, missionize on behalf of idolatry one person, or uh, not to missionize multiple people, the, becoming a media, whether it's one person or the, many, to idolatry. And it's, it's an obvious thing, makes obvious sense, that also a non-Jew, a descendant of Noah, is prohibited in this, he's warned in this. This is clearly a part of the package of, of, of idolatry. And also a, a, a court of a Torah court of Israel executes someone who does this. It's a, a capital crime for a Jewish person to uh, prosthesize and missionize other people on behalf of idolatry. And therefore, it's, it appears that uh, we can see that also B'nai Noach, non-Jews, are warned about this because we have a general principle which has been brought, he brings out many times, that any um, prohibition that is a capital crime that would a Jew would be executed for is also capital crime for a non-Jew. And if it's in, in the realm of idolatry, we're talking about here, and same in the opposite, if the a Jewish, if a Jew would not be, it's not a capital crime for a Jew, then it's not a capital crime for the non-Jew. So since this is a capital crime as part of the package of idolatry for a Jew to participate in this, then it must also be that it's a capital crime for a non-Jew to participate in this. The din ir hanidachas lo matzinu gam im ba'are aki im ba'are Yisrael, and even though the law, the the rules or the judgment of a ir nidachas, ir nidachas is a city um, where the red in the Holy Land where there's certain many many different rules that apply to it, but where the population as a whole becomes um, involved in idolatry and does not re, does not give up the idolatry, then the then there's a executed against that city um, judgment of a capital capital punishment, and the entire city is destroyed. All its possessions are destroyed. We're not allowed to take anything from that city. And we're not allowed to rebuild that city. So he's saying, even though that law is only appears to be referring to the cities of Israel. Since it's, nevertheless, it appears, it's, it's, it's apparent that since it's forbidden for us to allow to stay someone who worships idolatry in our land, in the Holy Land, like we explain later on in chapter 32, and it makes sense that a non-Jew is also warned on this, that he should not allow idolaters to remain. Because the non-Jews are commanded to bring about judgment for those that transgress their seven commandments, and how much more so that they should not allow these idolaters to live in cities, even in non-Jewish cities, 
they, these non, non-Jewish cities that are completely non-Jewish, the, the non-Jewish residents should not allow idolaters to live in their cities. So therefore, it's obvious, it's the, the bottom line rule, the din, din means judgment, the, 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 the practical judgment is that it's necessary to judge a person who is a missionizer, whether he's missionizing to many as a media or he's missionizing to one as a Macy's. And this is included in this, that a non-Jew is warned, he's obligated in dinim, in judgments. He has to create courts of law. And this is worthy of more investigation and, and inquiry, insight. Ayin Lahalan Simon Mem Aleph Agabeham Macy's and Lucy chapter 41 later on regarding this Macy's, the one who is the individual, the, the missionizer as an individual. So there's some very, very fundamental points over here, which is that Rabbi Steif is pointing out that you have to see the whole picture over here. You have to see the whole picture is to eradicate idolatry from the world. So don't get caught up the Rabbi Steif is saying and say, well, if I don't see the, the concept of Ir Nadachas only applies to a Jewish city, the, the concept of the wayward city that gets destroyed only applies to the cities of Israel. So it doesn't apply to a non-Jew. No, he's saying that understand the reality over here. The reality is that every human being has to know there's nothing besides God Almighty. And every human being is responsible to making sure that is uplifting his fellow human beings to serve God Almighty. And we learn that already the judgment, when it says, you know, these punishments and judgment and having courts of law and so forth, the primary purpose, the primary function of the courts of law is actually to uplift other human beings, to dedicate them into the service of God Almighty. Chinuch is the primary function of the courts of law, of the judges. They're responsible, and we've learned before, the judges are responsible for and, and really um, are, are at, so to speak, at fault if they have to even execute anybody. If they have to punish, if a court has to punish somebody, it's a reflection on the court's failure to properly inspire the people and bring them into the service of God Almighty. So this is a fundamental point that we have to understand that we're going now, just in another fundamental point over here. But you could see that you could say some, oh, there's a capital punishment over here. Someone says he, he's going to be a, have righteous indignation. He's going to, let's, let's set up a court of law, he says, and he's going to, you know, start carrying out judgment. But one second, you have to understand who's, if you want to, and every, every non-Jew has to understand that they have an obligation to have courts of law, which means that they have an obligation to be a judge in a court of law. Now, if there's more qualified people than you, then let them be the judges if they're God-fearing and so forth. But you fundamentally have the responsibility to make sure this court's a law. So you have to be the judge if there's no other judge. And maybe you are the best qualified person. But now you want to be a judge. Okay, ah, you stand up to the step of the plate. Yes, this is a capital crime. You're ready to be the judge. You're ready to set up the court of law in one second here. Before you understand that, you have to understand that if you're going to put yourself in the place of being a judge, you're also declaring that you are the one responsible for the fact that the other people are transgressing because you as a judge have the responsibility to make sure that they know what the law is and that they feel inspired and motivated to fulfill it. Now, this is really the responsibility of every human being to encourage and inspire their fellow human beings to know that they're created in God Almighty's divine image and to know what the right thing to do is. But a judge has an extra level of responsibility. He's the caretaker for the entire population to make sure that they are doing the right thing. So don't think yourself, okay, you can become a judge. You're going to put on a robe and you'll sit in your chambers. And then when they bring the, the, the accused, the defendant in front of your court, you're going to come out and you're going to be setting justice in the world by banging your gavel down on, the, the, um, on your bench and you're going to be declaring the person guilty and now you've established justice in the world. One second, 
Your job was to make sure that this person wouldn't have transgressed in the first place. Your job was to be out there speaking, to be out there teaching, to be out there uplifting people. So the, this now, we can now bring this full circle and see that when you have a city of human beings, every human being, is to, is, his job is to make sure that his locale is completely free of idolaters. The first action is to make sure that everyone's uplifted and inspired to serve God Almighty. But if a person is going to refuse, you have an obligation to make sure that that person is no longer in your city. Because he will bring down the entire city. It shows us the falsehood of the modern idea, the Enlightenment idea. It's really a pagan idea. Pagan idea is pagan, pagan Wicca, which is part of the enlightenment and marxism and so forth all these uh all it comes in many many different uh, expressions but the the pay and and actually in a certain way libertarianism is a reflection of paganism because we hear what paganism says paganism says do no harm right don't hurt anyone else and then the, that's the first uh belief and the second is do whatever you want so a person, paganism says, there's not, you, you, okay, don't, the, the, the way they publicize it, at least, they're not going to go claiming that they're killing people. And the way they make, the, the, this is the, the, the uh, how do you call it, the, um, the public version. But the lie is to think that what a person is doing in his own private space is not harming other people. And he could do whatever he wants. He shouldn't go out in the street and hit a person with a baseball bat. But if he's going to go into his own private room and he's going to bow down to an idol, that's his own business. So that's that's the lie. That's the lie of paganism. The Torah is teaching us what you're thinking about affects everybody. What you're doing in your own private space. Are you contributing to the increase in the knowledge of God Almighty in your thinking? Are you contributing to the increase in knowledge of God Almighty in your practice? Are you increasing in the bringing of beautiful new children into the world in your activities? That's the question. And how you conduct yourself affects every single person. It affects all of us. And therefore, we are all responsible to make sure to encourage everyone to do that. And as we're saying over here, that if a person is going around and trying to missionize other people to take them away from that truth, that's an act of destruction and war against his fellow human beings. And therefore, that person, whether he's Jewish or non-Jewish, um, are, are, is that they're, they're culpable for this. And are, the responsibility of every human being is to make sure that ceases. Now, any questions? We have one question here. How can we establish a rightful common law court? Um, so, and going into the credibility of different courts, and, and we have this challenge in every country in the world. The, the rightful courts are one where person, the judges and the participants in the court system, which is the people that the, the people in general know that there's nothing besides God Almighty. If they understand that there's a divine law divine guidance, God Almighty's loving guidance for every human being, and that the responsibility is to uh, teach that to every single human being, then that is what proper, um, proper rightful courts are. In fact, if you look at the common law, the common law is very much based on the Torah law. And if you read, you know, Blackstone and different compilers of the common law, from previous centuries, uh, English common law, you'll see that uh, what, what the Torah says is prohibited is prohibited in, in Blackstone also because it's, it's something that is inappropriate. Immorality is inappropriate. Murder is inappropriate. You know, helping other people kill themselves is inappropriate. All the things that are being pushed today, euthanasia and immorality and theft and so forth, are all forbidden under the common law. So what in those days, even though the people who were, you know, uh, setting up those courts had mixtures of idolatry into their thinking, but they 
did have a general understanding of the Torah principles, and they made the, the laws, the common law, the people agreed that this is the way they were going to live their lives. So it's really about restoring the, co the proper courts or creating proper courts that have no trace of idolatry is really dependent on the level of awareness and dedication of the people unto the service of God Almighty. From that pool of people, you will draw righteous judges and judges who will have it as their responsibility to dedicate the rest of the population to the service of God Almighty. That's, that's the way to do it. It's not so much about the structure of the buildings and the, the uh, names of the courts and so forth. It's about the, the mindset um, is the mindset of the people. And it's, the, it's, it's also, by the way, the mindset of the people is essential. If you, if you had one righteous judge, look, we could see that there were prophets of God Almighty that were murdered by the people or murdered by the kings. So you need to be creating. It's not enough to just be, say, okay, we've got a you know, top-notch judge over here. He believes in God. He's going to do the right thing. What about the people? Are the people willing to be um, participating in the, the system of God Almighty's divine system of justice? The, you need to have the people. And so therefore, it has to be about bringing the knowledge of God Almighty to every single human being. It's, there's, no, there's no shortcuts to that. Okay, any other questions? Don't be shy. Okay, so we covered a lot today. We've got this is a really exciting developments here that this is coming out to, um, to the forefront and, and God willing, we'll be sharing more about it as, we, as this work comes to fruition in terms of translating it and transcri transcribing and translating it and so forth. And um, I want to encourage you all to, to see that as much as we see things in the world around us that are not what we want to see, but we realize that good things are going on. They're not getting as much publicity um, because don't forget that the negative things are also being, the, the publicity of the negative things is driven in order to create uh, upheaval and people to become you know, anxious and fearful also. So our job is to steer a steady course and encourage other people to recognize what, that what's happening is because of one simple cause. People have lost sight of God Almighty, but they're, that they're created by God Almighty. And when we can reconnect to that, solves all those problems, all the problems. And that's where the answer lies. So it becomes extremely urgent and, and urgent, not in a sense of panic, but urgent out of a sense of encouragement and out of a sense of energized engagement in getting this message out to every human being. So God bless you all. And we'll look forward to seeing you later in the week when we're learning. Uh, Wednesday night, we started to learn about prayer. God willing, we're going to continue uh, Wednesday night. And then uh, Thursday morning, we have the Moon of Faith in Action. And then Thursday night, the Gate of Oneness. And then Shabbos, we have on Shabbos, the Shiva Shemba Aver. And you are very welcome. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. And if you, um, hopefully everyone, I saw some new people today. Make sure you're signed up at um, rabbismith.org. Uh, if you can send an email to info at rabbismith.org also. Just make your, sure you're signed up and get notices of the future learning. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oh, and also you can feel free to send, if you're new, send the email to info at rabbismith.org. like to introduce yourself. Tell us what inspired you to come here and, and so forth. It'd be great to uh, hear more.